Good evening. Uh, it's 5 p.m. evening. I guess it is when the days are getting shorter. Uh, welcome back to our final program for the day of day three of House of Pain's online knowledge conference. Uh, we are, oh, some, I'm going to mute everyone. Yeah. Sorry, that was my bad. Sorry. Oh, okay. Perhaps <laughs> it's fixed. Carling, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, we're so, so pleased to have you here joining us for this conversation. I do want to do a content warning off the top that uh, there may be topics covered that could be triggering um, and that you proceed with caution. If you need to exit, you need to exit and that's fine. Um, and I recommend if you are a sensitive person like me, that you have a glass of water and some tissues or anything that makes you feel comforted nearby. Pour notre ami francophone, il y a la traduction disponible sur Zoom à la barre de l'écran. Appuyez sur interpretation et sélectionnez le français, French. Um, and I do want to acknowledge our funders and partners before we get started. We're a community organization. House of Paint is very grassroots. And if it were not for grant money um, and community partners, we would not be able to make this happen. So thank you for the support of the City of Ottawa, the Ontario Arts Council, Government of Canada, Canadian Heritage, Association des Communautés Francophones d'Ottawa, CBC Ottawa, Ottawa Beyond, Dominion City, Alternative Hosting, Ill Abilities, Mural Roots, Auto Music Industry Coalition, and Produced by You. And uh, before I pass it off to our capable moderator, um, who is actually one of my favorite people in the whole world, and I don't feel bad saying that because anyone who meets her would likely say the same. Uh, we have Carling Miller joining us. You also may know Carling as DJ Avenue. Carling has been organizing in 2S LGBTQ plus communities in Ottawa for 15 years, predominantly through kind space in a variety of roles, and most recently as the executive director. Growth for Carling has meant struggling to hold on to humanity, kindness, and compassion for herself as a leader in the context of accountability and community care. Carling, we're so lucky to have you leading this conversation. Um, I'll let you take it from here and introduce us to the panelists. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, still not super used to a lot of praise like that, but let's go with it. Um, okay, so welcome uh, to the panelists and to everybody uh, that's joined us on Zoom as well as everybody who's um, watching this on Facebook. Um, this panel is uh, Call Outs Compassion and Accountability um, for the 2020 House of Paint Knowledge Conference. This event is taking place on the stolen land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. We are here because of the continued genocide enacted by all levels of government, government and our collective inability to free ourselves of the colonial and capitalist structures that force our complicity and the targeted oppression of indigenous people and communities, but also to the continued oppression of ourselves. With very rare exceptions, if we freed ourselves through the healing, through the healing, through healing the hurts and traumas we've experienced in our lives, we could dismantle the oppressive society for good. None of us are born wanting to take, uh, wanting to or take joy in the oppression of others. We are conditioned to perpetuate and uphold these oppressive structures for those that benefit. Figuring out how to hold on to each other is how we find our way forward. This is what has brought us here today. The majority of this panel will take place in English with French interpretation, which can be chosen by clicking on the interpretation button that should appear at the bottom of your screen. This panel is being recorded and will be transcribed in both English and French afterwards. It is important for all of us speaking today to be mindful of our pace and words for the interpreter 
and for those listening and simultaneously translating in their minds. During the panel, after 20 minutes, we will do a one minute break for the interpreter, Jimmy. The suppression of language, usually in favor of English, is one of the many ways that the oppressive society uses to keep us separate from each other, convincing us that the only way we will be accepted or understood is if we assimilate to the dominant language and culture. If I could just share a quote from um, a mentor of mine, whose name is Javi. All languages are perfect, right, complete, accurate, and rich, and the rich result of deeply intelligent mental processes. They are made by human minds as they try to communicate their view of themselves and the world so that they can stay connected and united while going through the challenges of life. All languages, all languages are of equal and vital importance. So, introductions. Um, so, um, as Veronica mentioned, my name is Carling Miller. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm uh, from two groups of people on my mother's side. Um, I was born in Canada in a small town called uh, Brockville, Ontario. Um, most of my family was born in that city as well. And we've been here for a few generations. And then I think we immigrated um, from like Scotland, Ireland, um, England, sort of like around that area. And on my father's side, from what I know about that, from what I know about him, um, is that he was a possibly a, a, an immigrant from Jamaica. Um, and that I have ancestral roots in um, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Um, and that's about as much as I know from that side. In terms of like what I do in the community, I am the executive director of Kind Space. I also DJ. Um, I've sort of taken up amateur gardening um, in this pandemic. I have a partner um, we share pets and um, mostly I have been taking a lot of naps um, in the pandemic. That's, that's what I've been doing. Um, so we'll just go around my screen. Um, so Jesse, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is rap legend Jesse Dangerously. Um, I was raised in a place I knew as Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, came to learn was um, imposed upon uh, a place called Chibuktuk um, in Nigmahi, uh, Nigma territory. Um, I moved to this Algonquin territory, a place I was told called Ottawa about 10 years ago. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a rapper and producer. Um, I'm a hip hop lover, basically, like since I was a kid, I'm 40 now. Um, as long as I've been able to go to where it was happening um, and seek it out, I've tried to be part of the hip hop where I was and um, it's brought me everything you know in my life and I've tried to uh, contribute to it be a collaborator in in communities near and far and um, yeah I've just I've been putting out records for just just over 20 years I've been I've toured uh the continent um with so many magnificent people and i've just been so fortunate with the experiences that hip-hop has has given me and uh you know any any time now i can pass any of that on give somebody else a hand you know i'm no i'm no genius or expert but i've just been doing it a long time um my uh my pronouns are most conveniently him but for the most part i think pronouns tell me more about the space I'm in, so I'm 
I'm more learning from the pronoun pronouns that people assign to me than I want than giving them to other people to say about me. Oh, my <laughs> parents, my parents, my parents, uh, Scot Scottish and English. Um, uh, I don't know much about my parents' parents. Cool. Thank you. David? Uh, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, David D. Pistol. Uh, I guess I would describe myself as a Ottawa-born person and raised in Chicago. Um, my mom is Jamaican, don't know my dad. Uh, I'm a photographer, animator, creator, writer. Um, I don't know much about my dad and have looked to seek further information about him actually in this current year. Uh, perfect timing. You know, build up with all uh, everything that's going on. Uh, just felt like the right time. So I'm still seeking to see what that will look like. Um, I'm pretty sure that we have some uh, some African heritage in there somewhere, along with the Jamaican uh, countryside. Um, but yeah, what I do for the community, uh, I pretty much tell stories through through my lens, documentation. Um, I've been away for a while. I've been living in Mexico for five years. It'll be like almost like my first year back back in Ottawa. Happy to be back. Um, it's allowed me to uh, engulf myself more into the community, which is great, um, and be a part, and help, help wherever I can. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Thank you, Kalkadan. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Kalkadan Hasafa. Uh, pronouns you can use. M P. Um, I was born in Ethiopia, so my people, I'm Abasha, um, also one quarter Oromo on my grandmother's side. Um, but I pretty much uh, came here, immigrated or when I was about five years old. So I've been on this unceded Algonquin land since about that time, since the late eighties. Um, in terms of the role I play in the community, um, I'm an artist, I'm a visual artist, and specifically I focus on murals and large scale community collaborative kind of projects. Um, I've had uh, a lot of interesting and unique opportunities through art to, to work with like many diverse communities and I really enjoy the collaborative aspect of mural making. I think it's like one of those things that you can really get a community behind and um, help reflect their story. Um, so I'm really um, just kind of exploring and enjoying being in that space as a kind of community based creator. Um, yeah, that's that's about me in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Jay. Hey everyone, my name is RJ Jones. My pronouns are they and he. I am Soto Cree First Nations, originally from the Plains from Treaties 1 and 4, which is Saskatchewan and uh, Al not Alberta, oh god, um, Manitoba, so Regina and Winnipeg area. Uh, I'm now living on Algonquin territory. I'm a two-spirit multimedia artist, educator, as well as full spectrum doula, and I'm very much passionate at building bridges and relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, and I've learned a lot about relationships and communication, uh, probably from being a Gemini, but also the work that I've been able to do um, through Kind Space and Planned Parenthood Ottawa, um, using um, sexual and reproductive health, gender and sexuality kind of as a tool um, that helps me teach. So I do a lot of that work through storytelling. Um, and that's really just like combining things that are within my culture, um, I guess with more, I guess like mainstream ways of learning and 
I've been able to run with it and learn a lot from working in a lot of different communities. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, so as a reminder for everyone um, who's watching on the Zoom, you can submit uh, questions to the Q&A function um, that's also located at the bottom of your screen. And um, we'll see if we can fit any of those questions in and potentially leave them um, at to the end. Um, I do have some prepared questions, but if there's some good ones in there, we'll, we'll toss a, a curveball to the panelists. Um, so let's just dive in. So um, this question is for everyone, but of course you can always pass if you want. Um, so tell us about an experience or a memory of making a mistake and, and being shown kindness. And how is it different from times you were shown harshness? Um, and uh, Kiako Dan, let's, let's start with you. Oh, okay. Um... So, I mean, immediately I, I was thinking of an experience that I kind of brought up a little bit too on the radio yesterday um, where we were painting a mural and um, like this is a mural that we had consulted a bunch of youth with and a bunch of community organizations and had put a large public call out for as well for, you know, pretty much a month ahead of time. And we really hope that, you know, everybody had uh, seen it and had been able to participate. But once we started creating it, uh, there was a petition that was started against the mural. And we were immediately like, okay, this is like, what's going on? What did we do wrong? You know, how do, we, what is this about, you know? So we immediately reached out to the people and uh, like, they, they, were, they were upset because they themselves hadn't personally been directly contacted and consulted. And from our perspective, like maybe that that was like due diligence that we didn't do. So by us reaching out to them and them, you know, kind of being able to be like, well, this is what you did wrong. Like I felt it, it immediately like de-escalated so quickly in a way that it could have gone a different direction very fast. And I think for them being able to be willing to work to with us was a kindness because they could have felt salty, you know, it's like, yeah. there was room either way for it to be, you could, you know, everybody had their own perspective on the subject matter, but like, I could see where they were coming from. So I, I respected where they were coming from. And I think that they appreciated that from our, from our end. So that, that would be an example for me of a time like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'm trying not to get into specifics because I'm trying to respect people's privacy and whatnot, but like at the same time, um, it, it was, it was a situation where, you know, it's, it's when you get called out, you have to really step back and be like, did I actually do something? And what was it, you know, and how, how, how do I approach this fairly and objectively? And I think for, for us, they gave us room to do that. So. Okay. And how was it? Um, how was it different from like another time that you made a mistake and and people's reactions weren't as uh, generous? Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably pass on that because I don't have a very good a specific example. Okay. But I think on, I like for me to say that, but if I could like kind of answer the question a little bit differently, I would say there's been times when people have like, I would say wrong me or like done something towards me. And I had to, you know, like really, um, there, there was times when I didn't get forget to see how that wasn't helpful to the situation. Okay. Thank you. David. Uh, the, there's a couple of things that come to mind, but the one that sticks out the most where I made a mistake um, and there was kindness given back uh, would be the situation with my mother. And um, when I was younger, uh, growing up, I guess I was around maybe 13 or 14, I asked my mom about my dad. Uh, you know, she said I was too young at the time to, to know the answer to that. And, you know, it's okay, it's my mom, you know, it's respectful. 
and as I got older and older, you know, becoming more of a, you know, an individual of my own and becoming, you know, quote unquote, <clears throat> a man, I think I asked my mom, I think it was roughly around 17 or so, and, you know, she was still like super, super hesitant. And like all these questions are going in my head, like, you know, who is this guy? Who is this person? I can't be complete without knowing, you know, the other half of me was what, you know, like what I was thinking. And so like time and time it would pass and my mom, you know, she wouldn't mention anything, which was, uh, it was bothering me, it was bothering me deep inside. And it came to a point where, you know, I shut my mom out for about a good two years. Uh, and this was roughly around the same time that I, that I moved back to, uh, back to Ottawa, I was going to school for animation. And then I would say maybe like after being here, maybe three months in or so, I got a letter, I got a letter from my mom and she explained uh, everything in detail of like who my father was and that come to find out that uh, my dad raped my mom and I was the product of that. And like, it made me feel like so, so, so low, but she did it in such a kind way. You know what I mean? Like she was so, so loving and respecting and uh, she explained how, you know, why she did what she did but um, she was so kind about it. Like, and I felt so guilty for like the longest time. Uh, Cause here I felt I was taking, you know, I was being selfish in a way. And, like my mom was just like, you know, she was looking out for me, you know, like, you know, how do you tell your, your only son that uh, his father is, you know, yeah. is a rapist, right? Uh, but in that process, it brought us closer together my mom is probably like the strongest person I know. Um, but yeah, I think that would be one time where, you know, I, I messed up and I would still be able to, to grow and, uh, and be loved in the same, in the same account. Um, being called out, I can't say I can think of anything really uh, in that regard, so I can't really comment on that. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And um, and if anybody needs to like do a little shake, that was like pretty heavy. Um, please feel free to do so. Uh, RJ, I um, I think I'm thinking about times where when I first became an educator um, in my community, specifically talking about um, gender and sexuality, the ways in which I had initially gone about that was mostly like being angry and upset at some of the older people in my community for being the ones to really project homophobia and transphobia and I'm not it's not unusual to like experience like elders and older people in our community to say like oh like transness is a result of like colonization versus it's actually like colonization is a result of the erasure of transness and I think one of the times that I'm thinking of specifically is like when I was called to do like a session talking about gender with like a group of indigenous youth there was this like one yeah she was just like this mohawk auntie who had snuck into the session and really she didn't sneak in because we're not uh, really allowed to tell um, older Indigenous women to leave our, those spaces. But um, she was there and I talked a lot about how, like, I was there to affirm Indigenous youth. And I said, like, yeah, like, the older generation is homophobic and transphobic and really is, like, there is an issue within our communities. And I think during this time, like, it really made me um, completely change and transform the ways in which I engage in education and the ways that I see conflict um, because she she had actually so it's interesting because she got really upset with me and was like yelling at me and of course if we're in a sharing circle like we kind of have to listen so I was listening to like what she was saying and I found that no, nothing of what she was talking about actually was really about me it was about like an instance in which she was reflecting on and she was angry at herself um, for whatever she had done. And I was a bit nervous because like the end of the 
session, she had come over to me after like kind of being yelled at by a native woman, which is I find always kind of tough to be yelled at if um, they kind of look like or like have the form of your mother. So (laughs) she ended up saying like, I wasn't angry at you. I was just remembering a time where I had been, I had actually caused harm to somebody that I care about. And I think that's, that moment was so intense for me because like she came to me and and apologized and said like I actually wasn't yelling at you I was just you know remembering a time and what you had said like made me like bring up a lot of stuff and that's when I realized like the words in which we have to use in spaces have to be like intentional and not um just used to cause harm so I started to shift the ways in which I use language and take away um, any shame-based language and to not say like yeah all indigenous people are older indigenous folks are homophobic and transphobic and while that might actually be true um, it's really identifying the roots and making it actually a systematic thing because it isn't really their fault it's like being a part of like residential schools in the 60s scoop that actually kind of took that away from them and that really made me reframe the ways in which I engage in certain conversations. And I think when I understand the history um, and the roots of why something is or why something isn't, um, it made such a huge difference. And I think generally like making the transition, not physically like in, in transitioning genders, but like from only living and working and existing in indigenous spaces to like branching out into LGBTQ spaces, I found that it completely like reworked my understanding of like love because in my community, I was always taught love is conditional and there's always consequences of like loving people who aren't like you, but that ended up not necessarily being true from someone who is a bit different from most people in my community. So I think like I felt a lot of harshness from like my own communities that when I went to another community where people would actually just call me RJ with no questions, people would use like correct pronouns and all of these things that just, we assume are things that are just like should be a part of our society, but isn't true behind like communities that don't necessarily, or communities that really suffer from like the effects of colonization. It's really hard to make an older person understand that yeah these things are traditional in a lot of cultures not just indigenous cultures but across the world um but it was really like colonization that took that away and i think that that shift of like being treated like a human in the ways in which i wanted to be treated like drastically changed like how i started to love other people but engage in these conversations and to engage in just a way where I try, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt, or I try to think in a, like, I guess a perspective that thinks about history before like judging, jumping to judgment. I always find I'm like a very, like, I, I tend to be in a very neutral place in most conflicts um, that are outside of my own, of course, <laughs> but neutral conflicts when I hear it from other others, because I think, yeah, just from like my experiences and how people ex- like the ways in which they engage in emotions and like how different that was um, to experience like, oh, like this person wasn't mad at me and was actually very kind to me in the end and thanked me and gave me a hug instead of like, what I had initially seen being yelled at. Like it just really made me see how powerful like language can be in these conversations. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing um, your learning. Um, Jesse. Kindness. Um, I think I've received a lot of kindness in, in all the, all the times that I've, uh, you know, gotten pushed back on, on ways I've been. Um, and sometimes even harshness is its own form of kindness. Um, like I, I do have like a little like litany of things that, that marched through my head. It's like a time I wrote something that was insensitive and somebody had to tell me. And sometimes, sometimes they told me with the most grace and generosity 
and like put my feelings first and that helped a lot and then there were other times where people were blunt and you know let me know very directly how the impact i was having on them and that was the perfect thing at that time and i've been uh you know i've been also defensive at times i don't always get it the first time i hear it no matter how nice and no matter how harsh and i think there's like parallel things that go along like sometimes it's really about the relationship between the person who's giving you the feedback and you and sometimes that relationship you know needs an element of love and patience there even if it's that's not what goes along with the type of feedback that's being given and like i i kind of find like i almost can't call it like what's going to work with me or with other people like i appreciate kindness and i value kindness a whole lot um but you know there's also like a risk of i don't know encouraging harmful behaviors by by coddling the person who's receiving the call out too much any to keep away from like any really major uh um examples i i can just i have a a, a a thing that stuck sticks out in me that lasted a few years um like i'm i'm very online and uh i've gotten lots of conflict from me trying to tell people what they were doing wrong and from other people telling me what i was doing wrong and we were all right and we were all wrong every time um but i definitely like i got so involved in calling people out that especially people who were more conflict averse stop wanting to be my friend and i remember losing like a very close friend very abruptly um i was suddenly just blocked on everything i was so mad and i thought it was like so rude and hurtful and like for maybe 2 years it would just like hurt me when i thought of this person and i would write him i don't know i wrote him like a couple of emails that were like long trying to be like can we just talk about this i don't know what i did and and got nothing and i remember like feeling very resentful about it and then we weren't we weren't living in the same city one time i was visiting home and i was at a friend's dj night and i saw him i i didn't even realize he was in town and like my stomach dropped and i was like am i going to have to like avoid each other is this going to be like a conflict and he kind of came up to me and grabbed me and said we got to talk outside now and i was like oh. I don't think I'm going to fight but what's happening and I followed him outside and he said man I'm so sorry I just haven't know how to known how to say it like this whole time like um you really upset me and I didn't know how to talk to you about it and like it was just so it was so sensitive and like he sounded just like how I was feeling like mm-hmm. the whole time and like all of the resentment I'd had from him up to that point not only like melted away when i saw how he really felt um i tried to get him to help me remember like what i had done that pissed him off and i realized he was so in the right he was a thousand percent in the right i had been like thoughtlessly like antagonistic to a mutual friend he saw that he didn't like it he didn't want anything to do with me for a while and then didn't know how to walk it back and like You know, that was about our relationship. And there was a thing that happened where I was in the wrong. And you know, I even got to the point I had developed to the point by then that I knew it was wrong even if I'd never, you know, I I made up with that other friend a different time, but it's just it's just I guess harshness and kindness is so complicated and they can like go together and sometimes like when I'm at my when I'm at my best and my least like uh um I don't know defensive or precious like I can catch somebody's harshness and and try to hear them through it and maybe that even helps me hear them better but like you know I also think kindness is really beautiful <laughs> so I tr- I try to find the the way to be kind when I remember to hmm. That's good yeah I'm uh Um I'm hearing a lot that you know it's like it's really important to understand 
um, the story that's like going on for people because it's quite different from the stories that we might be telling ourselves about what ha what's happening um, in that situation versus like what somebody else's story is telling them that's happening um, in that particular situation and just the ability to be able to um, listen to each other is so important. And so just before we um, pause for the interpreter, and this is just open to anybody that might want to answer, but um, what's, what's something, what helps you be able to listen to someone? I think I tend to be in a good position to list like i tend to like not for you know obvious visible reasons i'm i've got i've got the opportunity to i've got more to that i can absorb you know like i'm more privileged so i can listen like i just know that about myself hmm. i should i know that i should so that's why i do okay yeah, uh, for me, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, after going through that experience with my mom, and just being able to humble myself and, you know, just be an open ear to maybe even try and help, uh, curiosity as well, um, and just trying to absorb and listen and learn. I think that helps for me. Um, if I could chime in, I would say, like, I've had a lot of situations, especially this summer, where because I'm dealing with people on the street and in public and they want to come and talk to you, um, and you have to kind of, like, be very open and put yourself in a space where you have to, you know, feel like you're inviting and ready for that conversation at all times, even when you're not. And... You know, for me, I found that really challenging. And I think the the biggest takeaway I had from this summer was just kind of like they were saying, humbling myself and just like kind of removing like, oh, maybe it's like, oh, I'm thinking about my timeline and like the work I got to do and this and that. And like, there's other things going on in my mind, but like for that particular moment in time, just kind of putting myself in that person's space and they're happy and they want to just share some energy and just trying to be ready to, to listen to them. And then of course, there's the other situation where they may not have the best thing to say and you still kind of have to be um, ready and open and like what happens is sometimes that wears on you and you know it makes me feel kind of closed off and not ready to listen to people but um, again like I, like I said I just kind of have to put myself in that space where I'm open and ready and willing to hear people out. I would say um when I'm in a good like emotional place and I feel like like I've done the things that I need to do to take care of myself, I think it allows me to be able to show up and listen to others. Um, I find when maybe emotionally I'm not in a good space, like I think my capacity to be able to listen to others like completely like diminishes. And I think too, like generally yeah, I'm, I always tell folks, like, when you're, you as a person are taken care of, it's actually easier to show up for, for other people, and I strongly believe that, because I think as someone who, like, struggles a lot with, like, just a chronic depression and constantly being in the ups and downs, like, my entire life, like, I know what times I would actually be able to hear and really, like, be compassionate to other people and the times that I'm unable to do that. So I think really it always goes back to like where I feel um, emotionally and am I taken care of to be able to like be present for others because yeah, there have just been times where I, I've been terrible to others mostly because I haven't felt well. So I find when I put value into actually, you know, caring for myself, I tend to be like a better human being to be around when I make choices that make me happy as an individual or like learning, like to identify like what are my needs. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so how this break works um, for the one minute for the interpreter is um, 
we can mute ourselves. Um, if you want to turn your camera off for the panelists for the minute, you can do that. Get up and stretch, look away from the camera. Um, but the idea is to just sort of like to be quiet, both to give the interpreter a break, but also to like, you know, give our minds a chance to absorb everything that we've um, just listened to. Same thing for the people watching. Um, it's time to like reflect on things that have already been said and you can think about it, put questions in the Q&A um, for people watching on Facebook. You can um, put those questions up there as well. Um, and then I'll, I'll call everybody back. So don't go too far because we'll jump right back in as soon as the minute is over. Um, but yeah, here we go. Thanks. All right, that's a minute. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, my next question for all of you and um, anybody can answer is, uh, how do you see call outs um, happening in particular in artist communities, but also in any of communities that you're a part of. Oh, Jesse, if you're trying to talk, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, technology, thank you. Um, but like, Communities are distributed really differently now, artistic communities and like interest groups and also like other types of affiliations. Um, we're all, many, many people are connected through social media in a way that's like, you know, developed over the last 20, 25 years to be uh, really, really different than what came before. And I, it's it's kind of led to with like mainlining things like Twitter and Facebook feeds. Um, not only is there a great deal of like broadcasting everyone's thoughts as they come up, but everyone's reactions as they come up. And it's made calling out in a very direct and immediate way within and across communities, um, you know, a pretty familiar site. Um, when you know they're and it just it, i think it resonates differently from if you had to like call someone up or take them aside or shout at them in front of a of a crowd of people um everything's in front of a crowd of people now and uh in in a way you know in a way there's there's great advantage to that um and in and in a way it just it makes everything so much more fraught um People are very afraid of being perceived wrong, uh, very defensive about being perceived wrong. And, you know, it, it can create these great schisms. Um, you know, when stuff that like really deserves to be brought up is brought up in a way that the person hearing it isn't ready for or appreciative, appreciative of, or if like the way it's brought up eclipses what's been brought up. You know, it's, it just takes a lot more accounting for in these in these spaces where 
were all shout, uh, speaking in each other's ear constantly in a giant group. Anybody else have any thoughts? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I just uh, I asked how um, how you see callouts happening um, in artist communities specifically, but in any community um, in general that you're a part of. I think generally, like kind of going off a little bit of what um, Jesse was saying is that there are a lot of like definitions on what people think community is like and I think being able to define that can determine like how successful like an accountability process can go. Uh, I think too from like really looking into like what does restorative justice look like and knowing this is a common like practice amongst indigenous communities like pre-colonization trying to apply or at least like look at conflict through that like method of um, com really just like conversation. I think a lot about how uh, some people think community is just having the pals you go to brunch with, but those aren't the people who are gonna necessarily um, take the time to, to maybe call on you if you're tr mistreating your partner. Um, there are people who, if they see someone like harming a loved one might actually say like, hey, like this is something that I think needs to, to be addressed. Um, generally, like, I think it really shifts from community to community because the ways I see like a lot of like lefty communities that I engage with on Twitter, it feels like there is zero ability to like show compassion for the opposition. And I understand you can be uncomfortable by what somebody is saying, but also too, like as someone who has done a lot of education with a lot of older people in their community, specifically around um, difficult topics that sp very much like affect you. Like I've had to listen to a lot of stuff that n made me uncomfortable, but also listening to them made me understand like you literally only think this way because of something that is bigger than you. And the second that I give you like a different way of thinking, you're willing to listen. But a lot of the times, like I think accountability and call outs go back to uh, a higher level of privilege. And that's actually like academia and schooling and access to this language. Cause the second that I learned about like, I guess LGBTQ language, it made me feel free and liberated, but it's still something that my community doesn't really talk about. Like you won't see an LGBTQ related pamphlet in my community. And this is not uncommon for a lot of different communities across the world, but to be like, oh, you did this thing that was bad because you didn't say this or this, it, it kind of makes me feel like, I think like I used to do that in my early twenties. And I, I realized like, I used to be like, I will not, talk to people who think this way but I, I I've just come through the work that I've done to understand that like actually that like the ways in which we engage in like call out culture it is so much more like it takes so much emotional energy um, to be present and to have the difficult conversations but the amount of people that I'm just like, you know what, I'm just going to give you the benefit of the doubt and let's talk about gender and sexuality so that you don't bombard your like little native queer trans children about these conversations. I'll be that person. And the ways in which like that person just needed someone to talk to about maybe some like kind of like not so good ideas of the world, like it shifted significantly. And then I was able to apply that same knowledge into a lot of different spaces and it made me realize like, yeah, we, I think as a society in this Western society, just have a discomfort in un like difficult conversations and we do our best to avoid them. So of course, like when we're talking about call outs and accountability, this is just something that people don't want to talk about because for some reason, when we're talking about call outs, it just becomes a, you as a person are personally a bad person versus like, it actually it's your behavior. And I think too, like 
yeah, like there's just different ways in which communities engage in this. And I think it really depends on like how the emotional health of those communities are because I've seen communities who are just unwilling to have certain conversations, but I'm like, no, that's more about where, like to me determines where you're at versus, um, versus like your, like whether you can even talk about these things. Um, so I think it always goes back to like one, like what are the ways in which this community engages where they actually like, go beyond brunch and have the difficult conversations that are necessary to actually make communities sustain sustainable because like my I think even in a pre-colonial context like my community like it doesn't make sense for, like all of these elders in my community are like yeah yeah we uh we definitely wouldn't um we definitely like wouldn't like kick LGBTQ people out because what if that LGBTQ person was the best hunter in our entire community and we just kicked them out? That means the entire community is going to suffer. So it's less about like, oh, who that person is and more about like, what do they bring to that space? What are we willing to do to make sure that we can all continue to be together? Um, and I think that's the ways in which I think, like the ways that I think about community is like someone when things get difficult like it's going to be uncomfortable it's going to suck but not necessarily like trying to jump away from the discomfort immediately which is something I'm definitely guilty of and I'm 110% guilty of but I think it is still like something we should strive towards and something I will continue to strive towards until I can I have capacity to do those things yeah that's yeah you you bring up um, something important that uh, I'm so sorry, panelists. I'm going to skew away a little bit more from the the questions that I had shared with you earlier. But this brings up a really good um, segue to talk about um, cancel culture and disposability, and um, sort of like you know where that's where that's come from. Is it useful? I know we're like, you know, there's the broader like celebrity cancel culture um, that we see with, you know, big name, whoever um, being canceled for whatever thing. Um, but then there's also like within our communities, just like here locally or, you know, a little bit spread out. Um, where it happens to, it's just, you know, not on TV constantly. Um, so, yeah, I'm curious about um, your thoughts around cancel culture, disposability, um, anything that you'd like to share. Um, and maybe David will start with you if there's anything that you want to say. First, cancel culture. I don't necessarily believe in it. I think it's sort of foolish, to be honest. It, I think it kind of takes away from humanity as, as far as like second chances, you know, believing that, you know, once, one, once a person makes a decision or makes a mistake that there's no coming back from that. Uh, I don't think that's how we're equipped or how we're built. We all evolve, we all change, we all make mistakes. Um, and there, I, I just don't see any love in that. I don't see any care or affection or empathy. So I don't really necessarily get the whole council culture and how it started or where, you know, where it's going. But uh, yeah, I just, I don't agree with it at all. I think it's, I think it's almost, almost like a God complex because people are, you know, like, oh, I'm going to cancel you because I don't believe in, you know, your, ideologies or the things you're saying or what you believe people just take that power and say we're gonna you know you're no longer valued and that's not true and it's dangerous so just sort of my thoughts on it Dr. Dan? um yeah i mean i definitely i definitely have to agree with what david's saying and um i think like I always just kind of relate certain things to my own personal experiences. Um, and there's times where I've been in situations where, you know, people have been telling me like, 
oh, put that person on blast, you know, like, you know, and I had to think about the consequences and like we're all saying, you know, it doesn't really leave room for that person to to change their behavior or to grow now. Like there's certain situations, like I think cancel culture is a byproduct also of just like, you know, this digital age that we live in where it's like, it's easy to cancel things, close a screen or delete a person or block a thing. And it's just like, it feels very, you know, simple to just like say, oh, we're done with that and toss that out and move on to the next thing. Um, but like th there's a danger in that certain certain things certain you know uh, situations I could see where it's necessary for example it's like somebody is in a position of power that they're abusing you know like that needs to immediately stop so you know maybe like in a situation where all other recourse hasn't been possible them being you know publicly <laughs> put on blast and then like losing their done then not being in that position maybe that was for the greater good so that less people came to harm you know but like that's a harsh way to go about fixing things in our society. I don't know. Um, so yeah, overall, I don't know. I don't think it's the most productive way to get things done, but I do see in, like in a larger cultural context where it's coming from. Um, yeah, Jesse, I don't know if you are unmuted because you wanted to say <laughs> something or if you're just unmuted. Oh yeah, I just wasn't muting. Um, I, I think that we talk about a lot of different things when we talk about like the phrase cancellation and especially like the, the phrase cancel culture. I, it starts as a, a, a joke, like a glib way of saying mm, we're off that like um, and, you know, it gets applied to probably, first of all, celebrities or public figures um, as a way of saying, like, I don't F with them anymore. I don't want anything to do with that because, you know, for and there can be any number of reasons and any any amount of severity but when a person when a person feels like they're in danger of being canceled it's such like a, a blanket concept um you know it the, the ostracism exists and you know there's there's really different contexts for it all like if when you're thinking about whether to engage with a celebrity um it's definitely fine for you to be like, that person doesn't make me happy anymore. I know what they did. I'm never going to stop thinking about it. Like, you don't have to ever want to hear their songs again. And you can even, you know, you can even be like, I like, I think when cancellation really came into it around the, the cancel R. Kelly hashtag five, six, maybe more than that years ago now. And like, and that was like a plea for, um, to be heard you know by people who like were inundated with knowing what he was doing and also couldn't escape him in in their like recreation mm -hmm. like um and i guess like but like the idea that like okay this can actually have an effect i mean it took forever for it to really affect his career but it was in the conversation for a while for the most part, other celebrities, like Liam Neeson just announced a new movie today. Um, and like maybe a year and a half ago, he told, talked about when he wanted to like kill any black person he met. Like, I think it's actually pretty rare for people with power to get canceled. It's always a referendum on their, on their, on their social capital. And so what we need to watch out, like all of the compassionate things that were just said about like, you know, it's not loving, like, we got to watch out for people in our lives who we can reach and who have a context in a certain part of our lives. Cause like the brunch, the brunch gathering analogy is great because a lot of us um, with our social media, we're at brunch constantly. And if we cut somebody out of our social media, that doesn't really mean they're being voted off the Island completely. Like that, like that might just be where you go for brunch. Um, so I think I think I think that maybe maybe engaging with the concept of cancellation, um, you know, in a way that does like guard people who are who have been harmed and who can continually be harmed by people um, with shared access in a community, just needs to be broken down to like what are the contexts people should have access to each other in, how do we facilitate contact between other people, and like. You know, it, it is it disposing of someone to not have them at a certain party, you know? 
And is, is your Facebook just a party that everybody's always at? Um, I just think that like, these questions need to get asked before we can like decide, like, I never cancel anybody. I always cancel somebody. Toxic cut them off versus nobody's really toxic. Like, they're both true. Humans stay human always, even if they're whack. And, you know, there's a context for that, but it might not be brunch. And it might mm -hmm. not be the movie that you go to see or uh, or the record you put on. Um, just to yeah. do a time check, because it is 6 o'clock. Um, but, Carlin, we have an interesting question in the chat from Kira Lynn. Did you want to maybe address that? And then we can move over to the, um, the breakout room where everyone can turn on their video and have a conversation. Would that be OK with you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did want to um, uh, talk about that a little bit um, after everyone had had a chance. For sure. Cool. Yeah. I will uh, uh, get back out of here and I'll post the link to the breakout room in the chat. Um, so when this window closes, you're all welcome to join us in the other one. Okay. Good. Can I yeah. quickly speak to that since it was directed to me? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I think too, when I have like these particular conversations, I'm not thinking of people who like actually do harm towards other people. I mean, like, yes, it, but like, but there are different types of harm as in like physically assaulting someone versus the microaggressions that I find a lot of white people tend to get away with in a lot of white spaces where they're like, well, I didn't actually intentionally mean to like you know, be this person who really, like, projected, like, my misunderstanding of, of understanding, like, race and racism, um, like, these are the kind of things that, like, I tend to think of, because, like, a lot of the work that I do specifically within, like, anti-oppression and really just, like, analyzing biases, like, I think no matter what, like, I, and I, and the brunch analysis actually came from um, a lot of issues that are happening in my hometown, like Regina, where there was this Facebook, or no, no, this Instagram page that had to actually, like, be created because there were so many men in power who were able, because it's a smaller community, who are able to continue to get away with like serial harming women in really, really, really disgusting ways that like a lot of folks actually had to come forward and take and use an anonymous like Instagram to start exposing these people. It's like call, I can't remember on the top of my head what it's called, but it's really just to expose like a lot of the really like shitty executive directors that exist in this particular place. Except like when I think of um, looking at someone who, you know, like, you know, whether someone is a bad person, but still does bad things. Like I find there's a lot of excuses for like specifically like very, privileged people but I also want to break down that I think there needs to be a larger conversation about privilege in um, when we talk about like ignoring when someone actually does harm to another person um, and again like I actually really liked what Veronica was saying about like it's not necessarily oh there's not it's not cancel culture it's accountability culture because I think that really differentiates um, when people are genuinely looking for accountability from a person who has actually done harm and maybe mass harm in different communities. Um, but really, like, I don't want to ignore when someone does harm. But I also, too, like, as um, I've recently embarked on, uh, well, pre-COVID, like, doing a lot of work with young men. And because I'm a little bit of post-transition, um, I can blend into those spaces really well. Um, and throughout that entire process uh, it made me one like realize that like men need to start having these spaces where they're actually able to talk about like pain and able to talk about um like talking about like male privilege and masculinity and how that has like manifested within their lives and I was a part of a group that worked with young men in um, the high school system that really addressed like, yeah, there are privileges. How do we prevent, um, how do we really prevent like gender-based violence and, and kind of doing a deep dive on that. And it just made me realize like, yeah, there actually are no 
social programming for men besides like homelessness and addictions programs but i think there needs to be more like circles of like accountability where men are able to come together and really talk about that and hold each other accountable so when we talk about disposability I deeply and strongly believe like disposability has a lot of roots within capitalism and the ways in which we dispose of like material things, but also it's like inherently colonial, but also like back to my conversation about community is like for me, like when no matter what I'm going to do in my life, it will always be for my community. But I also recognize this is something that if you have like immigrated here um, and are like maybe five like white ancestors into like immigration here, like the understanding of community and Canadian identity is very different and in shifts because like for me, like at the end of the day, I'm, everything I'm doing is always going to be for an indigenous youth and indigenous people. But whenever I have the same conversation with like a lot of my white friends, they're like, I'm like five different types of white. I don't really have a community besides you know, like either conforming to like this understanding of like white supremacy or like trying to become an ally and really unpack how my whiteness affects other people. There's not a lot of options. Mm -hmm. So like, I think too, like when I, again, when I'm talking about communities, I'm, I'm talking about the ones who like, you will live and die for these people. Um, but yeah, like, again, like I think a hundred percent, if someone has physically harmed someone, like that we need to prioritize the people who have been harmed without a question and but when i'm talking about someone who maybe had mild like who not mild but someone who has been racist but also has the intention of wanting to shift their views there should be other allies willing to have conversations about that person with that person um but that doesn't mean that person needs to like suddenly just be plagued for the rest of their life like you are not allowed entering the space because um, you continue to like get your coffee at Bridgehead. Um, and I think too, like there are just times where we need to think about like, does this person have the capacity and intention to like want to give back to spaces, but I'm not actually including people who have done harm in that case. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and so I think um, just to re respect the time, um, I'll just wrap up um to say that uh um that like a hundred percent um agree with you and, and i also want to to add and make clear that um those that are um targets of oppression and and to also be clear that we all like are targeted with an oppression and we all um target others oppressively um so we all sort of like hold that space, but it is never the responsibility of those that are targeted with oppression to, um, you know, either educate um, people acting oppressively towards them, um, to hold space um, for people who have been harmful to them. Um, however, that is the responsibility of, um, you know, the people closest to that person, um, their community. Um, I think it is important that like addressing harm um, means that we have to like look at the person um, acting out that harm um, as a person and to deal with them as a human being. Um, and that doesn't mean so, and I think that often means because people are uncomfortable, unequipped, don't have the resources to actually like stick with a person to um, say, no, you need to stop this harmful behavior. And, and these are all the things that I'm gonna do to help you to stop that harmful behavior. Um, lots of people don't have those skills. Um, so we kind of brush it off with the like, you know, they're a good person, they didn't mean it, you know, um, and, and all of that jazz. And then we just sort of like, don't know what to do with that person. Um, and so they're just sort of like out here floating around and we're all just sort of like out here floating around. And then the person that was hurt um, or harmed is just like, so just like nobody's gonna do nothing about this. Um, and so um, that's where like 
that's where you know shit gets like real um so it is like it's it's really a skill to be able to like stick with people who have been harmful to help them not um do that again um it's an important skill it's not everybody's work uh, and it shouldn't be um and so i just wanted to make that clear um so if you haven't um seen in the chat and you're in the zoom uh, Veronica's posted links to the breakout room um, so that you can head over there and and, uh, and have more of the conversation. Um, and I think Veronica will come back and do like a little wrap up, but I also just wanted to um, thank Jimmy. Um, shout out to Jimmy for all the interpreting. Thank you so much, Carling, for leading this session. You're, um, you're an excellent moderator and such a compassionate person making time for everyone. And um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, everyone who's attended, thank you. David, Kalkanen, RJ, Jesse, Jimmy, thank you so much. Um, I hope you'll join us over in the breakout room. Um, I have to close this meeting to start that one. So just grab the link in the chat. It was also emailed to each of you. Um, and I hope we can continue this discussion for another half hour or so as a group. Okay, thank you.